Uh, hello everyone, my name is Piotr Wilkoni and I am the embedded team leader in AGH Marine Student Club uh, and today I would like to talk uh, about the embedded system in our new project, uh, the underwater remotely operated vehicle, uh, Narwhal. Uh, so let me introduce our club and our team. Uh, our club was established in 2018 by then students of uh, the AGH University. Uh, they, since they were in the same age, they uh, simultaneously graduated in 2022. Uh, so the new version of our club uh, began in 2022. Uh, the main uh, field of of, uh, of work in our uh, club is the underwater robotics. Uh, so we basically build underwater stuff, mainly uh, the vehicles. Uh, we organized, reorganized everything in 2022. We conducted a few uh, recruitations and we gathered uh, around 30 members. Uh, these are different. These are people of different ages. Uh, from different fields of study, uh, the electronics, mechanics, ICT, and, and others. Uh, we had some uh, smaller projects during the period of activity of our club, uh, but the two uh, notable projects were the remotely operated vehicle GUPIC and the uh, auto autonomous underwater vehicle Haller, uh, which is shown here. Uh, now we are working on our new project, uh, the remotely operated vehicle Narwhal, uh, that we want to uh, show uh, and attend. At, uh, we want to attend the Meta Rovi competition, which is held in July 2024 in Tennessee, US. So I hope that we can do that. Uh, so I talked to you about the, that we had ROVs and AUVs. Uh, but what does it actually mean? Uh, so we have the start. With, let's start with the AUVs. Uh, these are the autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, these are the ve vehicles that have little to no connectivity with the ground station, uh, with the station on the surface. Uh, they basically um, operate by themselves. Uh, they have some AI algorithms built in. Uh, so they have also some some sensors, uh, some cameras, uh, and they have some tasks programmed in first, of course. There is an operator, a programmer, that programs some tasks, uh, some initial input to the robot, then the robot is thrown into the water and it must do the tasks by itself completely. Uh, and we might, we m must hope that it will return to the surface. Uh, these robots have no means of communication, no, not wireless nor wired, so they are usually also battery operated uh, because their main purpose is to uh, explore very inaccessible areas or very deep sea or some caves or the areas that are dangerous to humans. Mm, so we would rather avoid having any kind of uh, wires because it would limit the range and when, the, when we have wires, the range is usually limited to like 20 or 30 meters. Uh, the obvious drawback is that uh, the batteries have limited capacity and such robot can uh, must do its tasks in 20 or 30 or 40 minutes and then it must return because the, uh, the thrusters consume a lot of power. On the other hand, we have the ROVs, the remotely operated vehicle, and Narwhal is one of them. Uh, these are the complete, op completely, complete opposite of the um, AUVs. Uh, they have a constant connection with the surface. Uh, it's almost always a wired connection. Uh, they are fully controlled by the operator, so they have some camera on board, uh, which is the most important thing that is a feedback for the operator. Uh, and there is some uh, some control station on the on the surface. Uh, since they have uh, some, some mean of communication with the control station, there is also uh, power supplied through a cable from the surface. So the ROVs don't suffer from the problem of AUVs, which is the limited battery capacity, uh, because we have some PSU on, 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 surface, on the surface and we can uh, 
We can work with them, we can use them as long as we want. Uh, so here we have a very general model of our robot. Uh, we have uh, our narwhal and uh, control station with, with, power, with a power supply. Uh, and I told you that uh, for ROVs, the um, RF is practically unusable and we must use power, uh, we must use wired connections. And why is that? Uh, because the attenuation of the radio waves underwater is actually huge and uh, we can't use any kind of uh, protocols you would normally use to connect with, with uh, any device uh, on, on even a few megahertz. Uh, not to say anything about Bluetooth or Wi-Fi that work on gigahertz. Uh, the actual range that, that works under the water is, are the very long, very low frequencies. Uh, but the very long frequencies imply very long waves and uh, very long waves require big antennas and uh, since the robot is very small we can't have big antennas there and we would need small antennas but uh, the problem is that small antennas have almost zero percent efficiency compared with normal antennas and we would just waste all the power just for heating the water from the power amplifier not transmitting actually anything. Uh, the other thing is that on, even when using very low frequencies, the bandwidth is very limited. Uh, and as I said, we need some bandwidth to transmit, to stream the, the, the image from the camera. Uh, so that's why we need to use some uh, wired connection. And the first idea is what, what comes, that comes to mind is to use the Ethernet connection. Uh, it's, uh, it's easy to set up, it's reliable, it's cheap, it's well known. Uh, but it is it has a significant drawback that uh, the Ethernet cables are rigid. They are very rigid, and especially when we have the power supply cable, uh, which needs to carry 30 amps of current and have uh, negligible power, a negligible voltage drop across it. Uh, this power also needs to be quite thick. And when we have the Ethernet cable, the whole cord is uh, so stiff that it can alter the the forces that are applied to the robot and uh, make the maneuverability uh, even harder, even worse than, than without this cable. So that's why we would, uh, we, we thought about other um, solution and we uh, use the optical fiber uh, because the optical fibers are, are also cheap uh, and quite easy to use and uh, uh, they are much more flexible, much thinner. They, they, their thickness is negligible compared to the uh, power supply cable thickness. And since we can't do anything with the power supply cable, we need it, we need it to be thick. Uh, so we, we want to uh, reduce the thickness of the other wire. Uh, and the main point of this presentation is to talk about the embedded system. So the the question is where is the embedded system and why is it needed? Mm. We must notice that we have some computer on the control station because there is an operator, the operator has a game controller uh, to, to control the robot. The operator also needs to see the image from the camera, the view from the camera. Mm. So there is a computer that receives packets using the, from, through the optical fiber. Mm and see, see the view and, and control the robot. So we need another computer on, the, on board of the robot actually, because we need to receive the packets and then uh, convert the, the, the bits in the packet to actual electrical signals that control motors or, or servos or other stuff. Uh, but uh, the problem with the computer on board is that it takes space and we have very limited space on board because we have just one box or one tube on our robot. Uh, we want it to be small uh, and, and uh, light. Mm. Also the PC produces heat and uh, we have a lot of heat already on board because there are power converters, there are uh, speed controllers for thrusters and there is uh, quite hot inside. Uh, so we want to move the computer from, from, from the robot itself to control station. Uh, so 
that we can move some algorithms that would be normally running on the robot, like the trust allocation or some PID controlling, uh, and move them to control station, because why not? But then if we get rid of the computer on board, we still need to have some translator uh, that would, will translate the, the packets to actual electrical signals. And that's where the embedded system comes to play because it's uh, relatively easy to set up. It's uh, very uh, robust and, and cheap. Uh, I call it the executive embedded system because it basically executes its comments uh, on, on the actual hardware. Uh, so the, what, what do we have on board? Uh, this is the diagram of, of the elements of our robot. Uh, with is focused on embedded system, of course. Uh, in the center, we have the embedded subsystem board based on STM 32H745. Uh, this is a board with the MCU and some other elements around it. Uh, it's the, the core of the, of the whole embedded system. Uh, from the left side, you can see it's connected using the Ethernet bus to, to the Ethernet fiber converter. Uh, because we need to convert fiber to Ethernet to, to connect to camera and to connect to the embedded system. Uh, from the other sides, we have the uh, measurement inputs. We need to control the temperature and current uh, of the power converters, which is the very important block here, because it supplies all, all motors and servos, and it consumes almost all the power that is supplied to the robot. Mm, it generates also a lot of heat, uh, so we need to have some control over it. Um, as you can see, we also have uh, servos and HRS, uh, AHRS, which is the uh, positioning sensor that needs bidirectional bi communication, so uh, reading some acceleration data and setting some configuration to, to the device, and the, let's say, protocol translation or, or gatewaying is done by the embedded subsystem. Uh, why this, this MCU, the STM32H475? Uh, because there is a nucleo board with this MCU. Uh, this nucleo board has a um, built in ether Ethernet PHY with Ethernet connector so that we can get rid of all this cable mess when we have external modules, Ethernet modules, and which, which introduce some voltage drops across the cables, some interference, uh, and we don't want that. So we have one elegant solution, one self-contained board. Uh, also, we can have a, a few of these boards, and I can give these boards to, to, to the team members, and they can work using this board on, on the project in their homes. The MCU itself also features a uh, dual core. It's a dual core unit. It, it has, we don't use the second core actually for now uh, because the, the system is relatively simple, uh, but in the future we'll see. Uh, the MCU also has multiple PWM outputs and ADC inputs, and we need uh, plenty of them because we need to control the thrusters and servos with PWM and also read uh, temperatures and currents from all power converters, so that's why we need the ATC4. Uh, also, this board has been used in our previous projects, I believe in all previous projects, so we still have uh, plenty of these boards laying around, and uh, it's just, just fine for its, for its job. Uh, okay, so the question is, what are the embedded system tasks? Uh, so, as I said earlier, the most important task is the uh, providing the abstraction or translation between the data packets and the electrical signals, uh, because the control station may send a signal to set thruster free to 30% of its power, but it has no idea how, is it, how the thruster is connected and uh, what is PWM. Uh, so, the embedded system's job is to uh, get this, this input packet, then uh, the embedded system knows where the, the motor is connected and how to apply 30% of duty cycle to the PWM output. Uh, the same thing is with servos because they're also controlled by PWM. 
and with uh, sensors like temperature and current, we have the ADC, so we get the request from the control station to measure the temperature of, of say, power converter 2, and uh, the embedded system knows when the thermistor is connected, and it can read the voltage, uh, convert it to, uh, to, 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 to degrees Celsius, and return the data to the control station. And with IHRS is uh, the protocol gatewaying uh, between UART and and the Ethernet. And the other important task is to provide an interactive motor power control. Uh, it's because the power supply that we use and the power supply that is provided by the uh, competition hosts is the 48 volt 30 amp power supply, and that's slightly less than one and a half kilowatt. And the motors we use on, on board of our robot are the uh, 400 watts, and we have six of them, so it's almost two and a half kilowatt. Uh, so we just can't run all the motors at, at the full power because it will overload the PSU and it will just turn off, and we don't want that on the competition. Uh, so if we have such a, a case that uh, we have some motors, the motors are running on some on some power, and they are already consuming all all one and a half kilowatt of power. And then we receive a, a request to um, set one motor's power to to the higher level. So then we know that we will uh, we will reach the the threshold. We we know that we will overload the power supply. Uh, so that's why we want to introduce some some power control. Uh, that we can proportionally decrease the power of all motors and then increase the power of this one motor so that we can that the force vector that applied to the robot will remain the same the same we have the same direction but will be just proportionally scaled uh, so the robot will be just swimming slower the other important thing is balancing power convert converter load uh, since we have the 48 volt 30 ampere supply and the motors are uh, have a nominal vo working voltage of 16 volts we need to decrease the, the voltage three times uh, so it also yields three times the current so we have almost 100 amps for the motors uh, we can do that with one uh, one power converter uh, we need a few of them and initially we have some motors connected to some power converters and if we have a situation like uh, there are two motors that are running on their full power or, or at a very high power and they are connected to the same uh, power converter, uh, we would rather disconnect one motor and connect it to, to the other power converter which is uh, less loaded or not, not loaded at all. So we can do this kind of balancing power load, power converter load uh, just to make sure that, that that the power converters won't fail and uh, we won't fall out of the safe operating uh, levels. And the last things are the fast over temperature and over current protection. Um, because we, we in theory you could, you could measure the, the current, we could measure the temperature, then gather all this data, send it to the control station and wait for the control station to respond uh, to some over temperature event for example uh, but it takes time and we want it to be fast we wanted to uh, to have some mechanisms that will allow us to uh, disable some systems immediately when some uh, failure is detected uh, if we detect that there is over over temperature, we could, uh, for example, lower the power or disconnect something immediately, uh, and we want the, the the whole system to react fast. And with the uh, con uh, the control station embedded loop, it's it's slower. So that's why we 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 would like to have it built in 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 the embedded system. The last thing is the failure detection uh, when we detect that, for example, we we uh, set a motor power to some non-zero level and we still read zero amps uh, that zero amps are drawn from the power converter we know that something is wrong that either the converter is broken or the motor or motor controller is broken and we want to notify the control station of such event uh, this is the 
firmware design diagram. Uh, it uh, this is actually the, the 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 modules that we have in our firmware. Uh, on the right side, we have the drivers that uh, directly communicate with that directly issue some uh, electrical signals or read electrical signals. Mm, so you have PWM driver for for motors and servos, the UART driver, uh, the bidirectional driver for for IHRS. The HC driver for temperature and current measurement for now, and maybe for other sensors also, and the GPIO driver for standard push-pull outputs for uh, controlling power converters and maybe some lights or other stuff. Uh, in the center we have the protocol stack, uh, which is the core of the translator that that uh, encapsulates the data that come from the Ethernet, and then uh, in in this data we have. Uh, some ID, and based on the ID, we can transfer the payload to appropriate driver that knows how to uh, parse the payload. Mm -hmm. On the left side, we have the network stack, the TCP IP stack, which is provided by the lightweight IP library, and the MAC, uh, Ethernet MAC uh, driver, which is provided by the HAL. Uh, there is also one independent block, uh, the control and protection logic block that is responsible for controlling the power, uh, this, this interactive power control and uh, also load balancing and failure detection. Uh, it also has a connection with the, with the protocol stack so it can notify the control station. Uh, as you can see, I named the, the, the block in the center as protocol stack or ROSE node. Uh, so what is a ROSE node? Uh, ROSE is a robot operating system uh, it is a widely used platform, widely used framework actually uh, for writing the software for robots. Uh, what ROS does, it, is that it provides a way of uniform uh, inter-process communication. Uh, so in uh, ROS uh, there is some core, some core process that, that uh, handles the communication and we have separate processes for all modules that are called ROS nodes. Uh, so here is, here is the example of, of such node. Uh, and the nodes communicate using a thing called, known as uh, ROS topics. Uh, so the node can uh, subscribe to a ROS topic and then receive the data associated with given uh, ROS topic. Um, All right, so what is the difference between the protocol stack and the ROS node? Because these are the two main approaches we consider in, in this, in this um, build. Uh, the ROS node is an elegant solution because we have our, our software which runs on the control station, uh, should use it, so at least should be using ROS. So, so all the modules like the uh, trust allocation or PID controlling or the, the GUI uh, controller controller GUI should be they all should be independent ROS nodes that communicate through the ROS framework. Uh, so I would like to have the ROS node as well in our embedded software that it's the another just another block of of the whole system. Uh, but there are some. Uh, some problems. Uh, the ROS is written for Linux and runs on Linux exclusively, at least in its native version. Uh, we can't, we don't have Linux on our embedded uh, system. So uh, there is a way to connect this together. Uh, there is a port of, of ROS for microcontrollers known as uh, micro ROS. Uh, but it raises some uh, compatibility issues because uh, there are new versions of, of this full Linux ROS. Uh, I think they are newer than the, than the current micro ROS version and uh, I believe it might create some, some issues with interfacing all this together. And uh, the other thing is possible implementation issues. We would need to integrate ROS into our current uh, embedded firmware which might not be very easy. On the other hand, we might have the protocol stack, which was our first idea. Uh, the, the similar approach was used in, in our previous projects. 
so we just defined a packet format that we use uh, for controlling our robot. So there was a module ID, uh, some payload length and the payload, which was uh, dependent on the driver. Uh, and we have to have this protocol implemented on both sides, on, on the controlling software and on the embedded side. Uh, it was UDP based for simplicity because we, with, with TCP, you need to worry about this, all this TCP disconnection detection and that, that when the connection is broken, it can take some time uh, for that, for the error to be detected. And you need to have some server and client and the client needs to connect to the server and we would rather just need, want to send the packet and hope that it reaches its destination. Mm. It's a good starting point for early, early iterations, uh, for earlier versions, uh, because it's easier to debug, uh, easier to work with, uh, especially when we are when we are just when we just want to have our robot working at, at the with very basic capabilities with very basic tasks, uh, like just turn on some some trusters, uh, and that's all that we would use the uh, protocol, our own protocol, uh, because it's easy to debug, we can, for example, uh, open the, uh, the Wireshark and then analyze the packets. Uh, but of course, we need to integrate, uh, at least in, in the uh, next versions, you will need to integrate into the roles uh, this Rose ecosystem to other Rose nodes, so we need to have the Rose node anyway. But the idea is that we can just push the Rose node up to the control station and make the Rose node the translator be between the Rose uh, framework, the Rose topics, and our own protocol stack uh, because uh, it should not be, uh, it should be easy to do. The protocol stack works with, with standard Unix-like sockets, uh, which are available on Linux, on Windows, on, on lightweight IP library. Mm. So that should be easy to implement. Of course, the micro solution is more elegant, but we will see in the future. Uh, so that's all. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will try to answer. Thanks for presentation. I have few questions about the architectural decision you have taken. Uh, why did you decide to use these micro roles, not, for example, free RTOS, which is quite of native or STM? Yes, uh, it's called roles, but it's not. It's not an operating system. This, this is. There is no shed, scheduler, no, no, no things like that. It's called roles. I don't know really why, but it's. That's the framework that facilitates the inter-process communication, basically. Uh, and I believe the roles actually runs on RTOS. We need RTOS to run roles because it forms some process on RTOS and uh, integrates into RTOS. Okay, and second question is about the custom communication protocol which you have created between uh, physical and also control station. Uh, have you thought about using something standard like MQTT, for example, or not really? Not, maybe not for now. Okay. And last question uh, from control theory, let's say. Uh, you've mentioned that you have PID controller on this main station. Is it correct? Not yet, but we want to have it. Okay. So when you have it, how you deal with delays which you will have between sending and receiving signal because uh, TCP IP is non-deterministic, so we don't know what are the delays and they will differ. Yes, uh, it's it's hard to say for me right now. Uh, I don't know if we'll be using the PID controller at all because the operator is kind of a controller in, in such scenario because the operator sees the view from the camera and then it and the operator makes some decisions on how to how to control the robot so 
I don't know if we if we really need it, especially that the PID controllers have uh, problems with with accumulating error uh, when we are using AHRS, which just uh, provides us the accel acceleration data, and we are we need to calculate the velocity and it, the, the error accumulates. So for now, we want we are focusing on on building a very basic version of the robot just to make it to to turn on the engines to turn on the thrusters and make it swim a little bit thanks uh, hello i've got a couple of questions as well uh first of all you've shown on the architecture diagram um that you have this converter between fiber and ethernet and uh Behind that, there is the embedded subsystem and there is the camera. Does that mean that the camera is a completely separate device with a separate IP address and, and all that, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know. It has some IP, but it's quite complicated because there is some SDK made for the camera and I don't know. I, I haven't found anything about like a standard streaming protocol that that we can use to, to get the view from the camera, the image from the camera, but uh, it has must have some IP. Uh, okay, uh, the next question actually kind of relates to, to, to one of the other questions that was asked. Um, are you using some kind of RTOS? And if, if so, what kind of RTOS is it? Uh, or are you just writing it completely bare metal? Uh, some, some of you would probably want to kill me, but no, for now we don't have any kind of RTOS. Uh, for now, maybe in the future it, it will change, but it was my decision to write everything bare metal for now. Because I came to a conclusion that we just want to do everything in the best effort manner because we don't really need to have anything real time. We just want to minimize the delays, maybe not really care about the, the jitter, but rather minimize the delays. Okay, so the last question is, you said that this microcontroller that you are using is dual core. Uh, are you using both of the cores and if so, uh, how? No, as I said, we are not using the, the second core right now, we are using just the one core. It has a M7 and M4 cores, but we are using the first one. Okay, thank you. Uh, since it's after hours pro project for most of you, I believe, uh, what's the estimated timeline for design of such device? Uh, do you mean the embedded system or the whole robot? The whole robot. Uh, we, the, the, the competition that, uh, is in, in July, so we hope that it will we will do it up to this day. But so when did you, when did you start? start? When uh, did you finish in July. Uh, the beginning of, of this academic year, so around September, October, something like this. Okay, good luck, sounds impressive. Thank you. Uh, okay, if I understand correctly from some other slide where you had this diagram, uh the communication between the device uh, this robot and the control station is based on tcp ip why tcp ip and not udp which would be uh easier and uh, faster yeah i wrote tcp ip as the whole family of these protocols but we are using udp okay A very non-technical question, so uh, what will be the most unique uh, point of this product? Like, what is more like the unique thing about this product? Uh, like com when, it, when, it, when you compare it with the other competitors? Uh, maybe th this, is a st this is a student project, so we just want to attend the competition and probably win the competition. But uh, the thing is that there are only two or three such uh, clubs in Poland, or even or even one other club that specializes in, in underwater robotics. So it's quite unique if, if, if we think about it, because the clubs that are building different kinds of robots, for example, some 
right, maybe not. And, and there's other robots. There are a lot of clubs that do robots. But the underwater robotics is a very uh, unknown and unpopular topic. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, thank you so much.